One of my first books, Trail to Heaven, which is a translation of Yagatane, the Danisa concept of, of the trail of song, uh, was one of the first books that I wrote. And I called it a narrative ethnography because it began with the story of how I became an anthropologist, uh, the story of the Italian Boy Scout vandals and first going up to Danisa country and, and being told uh, that I was on Indian land by feeding me from it. Uh, and then first meeting Charlie Yahi. Uh, it was probably the first time, other than in my thesis, that, that uh, I incorporated translations of texts into the book in an ethnopoetic form. That is a line-to-line -line form where, where you've, you've got a text that's translated um, from, or you can do it even if it's recorded in English if you want, um, depending on kind of the the content and the, the feeling one has about it. Uh, if it if it seems the right thing to do, and I, people ask me about this, well, how do you know when to put it in an ethnopoetic form? And I can't give a very scientific answer. It's just like, well, if it feels like the the, the way the person was speaking uh, breaks breaks down that way, uh, that's if that person he or she is speaking in what's, what seem like these lines that go together, that work together on the page, then I'll use uh, editors called line-for-line -line transcription, where, where uh, you, have, you have one line, a break, another line, and a break. And sometimes when there's one or two keywords or key lines, I'll, I'll segregate that key word, that key concept. It'll have its own line. Uh, so I'm not worried about uh, saving space on the page. Uh, it's it's doing the best quality, um, the, the the best translation transcription of the uh, of the text on, onto into writing that I, I can do to make it make it readable rather than if you just string it all out in paragraph form, uh, you wouldn't have the same sense of, of the the breaks the the pauses the, um, the the performative nature of of the, the text, and again, it's a, it's it's kind of like an artistic judgment. It's it's not a terribly scientific one, uh, but I guess that's mean why we call it anthropological poetics. Um, it's it's uh, it's one's judgment, knowing knowing having made the rec recording myself, knowing the speaker, knowing the context, knowing the content, uh, what seems to work as the best way of putting it on the page. So in Trail to Heaven, I included a number of texts by Charlie Yahe. These were before I was working with, with Billy Atachi, actually. So they were translated by some other people. But they seem to be good, good translations. Um, and um, there's, there's one passage there where Charlie Yahe, and, and there was another a woman dreamer who was alive at the same time. Um, and uh, one of the many trips that I took in, in the uh, Chevy van was uh, taking some elders from Prophet and Blueberry over to the halfway reserve, because they, they said, you know, we want to see Charlie Yahe. Um, and an interesting story that happened, one of his, one of his grandchildren, his, his one daughter of his lived at halfway, was married in the halfway, and, and one of her sons, uh, went over to, with me, drove over to the Blueberry Reserve to see if we could pick up Charlie Yahi and get him to come over. There was, of course, no telephones or anything in those days. So it was just like, well, I think he wants to come. And <coughs> so we were driving over, and, and I was playing the radio, CKNL radio, the local radio station, and it had some nice country and western music on it, and it was fine when we were driving over. When we were driving back with Charlie Yahe, I put on the radio again, playing country western music, and, and the grandson turned it off. And he said, old man, don't like that kind. And uh, didn't say anything more about why. 
Uh, but I, so I started thinking, well, uh, in, in Denisov tradition, every, every person has a medicine power that if it's violated, will allow that power to become too strong. It's called Weichige, uh, and it's actually kind of related to the Algonquian Wendigo, or Wittigo, uh, but it's almost diametrically opposite in its meaning. Rather than a sign of mental breakdown or something, it's a, a sign of incredible strength that has become out of con come out of control. And it happens if somebody violates a person's personal medicine taboo. And for each, each person's medicine, there, there is a personal taboo. So I figured there must be something like that going on with Charlie Yahi. I also learned that uh, he couldn't have any kind of wire strung around his house, even like a clothesline or something. Uh, or people would, would have snare night wires set up for you know, part of their hide working and stuff. He, he couldn't have that. And, and I figured, holy cow, I bet one of his medicines is spider. And, uh, and I'm, I've never 100% slam dunk figured that one out, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true, um, that that's the reason that he couldn't hear it. I, they told me anything made by a stringed instrument, he couldn't hear guitar music, fiddle, anything like that. Um, the same trip uh, to, to halfway, uh, Jumbi, Augustine Jumbi, was in, in his tent and uh, a local white person came, came in with a flash camera and tried to take a picture of him. Didn't ask, just did it, you know, just started doing it, this flash. And Jumbi, like this old man, just flash disappeared into the back of his tent. And she said, oh, this is crazy. Grown man like that, so afraid of a flash camera. She totally misunderstood, because I, I, I had figured out by then that his power was Thunderbird, not Tanae. You couldn't throw eggshells into his fire. That was too closely related to not Tanae. It was one of the things related to his power. And a flash, of course, is lightning flash. If, if you did a flash in his presence, it would be like calling down thunder and lightning upon the community. It'd be terrible, terrible outcome. And it would be out of his control. And it could, it could only, if that went to that, if it really went too far, he would, he, would, he would become the giant animal and ultimately he would become a cannibal monster. He would, he would ice would form in his gut and he would start having cravings to kill people and eat them. It was, and this is the Wittigo or Windigo has those same things, ice in the gut and, and cannibalism and so forth. But this is completely different, or maybe just Windigo hasn't been understood in the same way. I, I don't know. But, uh, and I wrote a paper about it so comparing Weichige and Windigo. Uh, so uh, that was another case where, where I, I, I learned uh, Jumbi's power was, one of his powers was, uh, was Thunderbird. Um, anyway, Charlie Ahe and the old lady, uh, Amma, uh, is, uh, was this, she was even older, I think. She was even older than, well, older than him, for sure. Uh, she called him a Shitle, a younger brother. Uh, so they, they were having a, a jolly time talking back and forth and trading songs. And she was singing these songs in a growly old lady voice. Uh, women don't drum, but they can sing. <coughs> she was... Uh, recorded all of this, the two of them talking back and forth. And, and part of that conversation also became part of the book. So again, um, I, uh, I thought it was appropriate to include some dialogue between two dreamers, an unusual occasion, the only occasion that it's ever happened in my experience, two dreamers talking in the same time. Um, and so it became part, part, part of the book. Uh, where were we, where did you want me to go from here? Uh, you want me to talk more about the about the vision? Yeah, I'll talk about more the, about the vision quest. Uh, vision quest in Beaver is called Shin Ka, which which means uh, to seek a song. Shin is song, and there's a relationship between dreamer songs and visionary songs, although they are not the same. Everyone, traditionally, would 
go on a vision quest sometime before puberty. Both men and women, boys and girls, would be sent out uh, to obtain power from a, an animal. And when they, when they go out, they're sent out by, by their family, usually an elder, grandparent, something like that. They, they're usually sent out to a specific place where it's known to be a power spot. Uh, sometimes they'll be sent to a place where another person has had, had the dream, empowerment dream, the Shinka. Doki Sachin, for instance, was sent out to where his father had had the same power, and he indeed encountered the same animal. And in Doki Sachin's case, uh, the younger, the animal, he stayed with the animal for, for quite a while, and then the animal said, your father is dreaming about you. It's time to go back. And then he said, but I've got something to do for you. He held out his, his hands, and Doki Sachin was this giant animal, and uh, I mean, uh, the, gi the giant animal was a giant animal, and Doki Sachin said, walk, walk along my hands, so my fingers, walk from one finger to another. He was that big an animal, Doki Sachin walked along his fingers, and at the very end, he pulled one finger back, and he said, nine, you've got nine fingers of life, and that means you're gonna live to be at least 90 years old and nothing can hurt you except old age. And indeed, he was a powerful man, and he, as far as we know, he did live, live to be that old because he had children who were still alive in 1900, prob probably from a, a later wife. Uh, those old guys tended to, well, every, both men and women tended to marry cross generations for their first marriage. So an older man um, would, would marry a younger woman. Sometimes they had more than one wife. Uh, if he was a good enough hunter and could do it. Uh, and, and then when he passed away, uh, his younger wife would now be, say, a middle-aged widow, and she would get together with a young guy who was a good hunter. And uh, as, as a result, uh, that was another way of, of stories being orally curated. Um, so, for instance, uh, Billy Tatchy's grandmother, Nat Ching, who's, who's, it was her nickname, uh, it means big. That was her, because I guess she was a big girl when she was a kid, so they named her Nat Ching. <clears throat> and uh, she, uh, she was married uh, to um, essentially her uncle, uh, whose, uh, whose, whose wife had been one of the grandsons of Duki Sachin, uh, uh, granddaughters of Duki Sachin. And she had died. He'd married her, I guess, uh, uh, when he was young and she, she was older, she had died. So they wanted to keep the band together. And, Duke, and uh, Nachin uh, was a relative, uh, but not too close a relative, even though it was an un real, real, actually a, 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 a real uh, uncle in our, in our terms. Um, but they didn't consider that to be too close. So she, so she married this guy, Apan. Uh, and we have baptismal records for him. We know when he was born, who his parents were, when, how old he was when he was, you know, a lot of stuff about him. Um, and they went off uh, on the trap line together. So she was 17 and he was, I don't know, 50s, maybe more. Hard to say, we don't know exactly. Uh, but as a result, she got all that knowledge, all that oral curation passed down to her. And as a result, then she passed all that information down to her grandchildren. And Tommy Atachi, one, one of the song keeper, one of the grandchildren, uh, probably his major source of stories was from his, his grandma, his Asun. So it was passed down from one generation to, to another. Um, some other Vision Quest stories. Um, one one story was 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 about um, a woman who uh, was told to go pick up an axe that had accidentally left be when been left behind on the trail, and of course it wasn't accidentally. This was when they were moving camp from one place to another. So one of the elders had left this axe on purpose. So they moved to the next camp, and they tell her, "You've got to go back and pick up the axe." So she went back, and on, on the trail, she saw that uh, there, there was the, the tracks of a wolf. 
that had been following them. That was So she's backtracking. It's really complex when you think about it. She's backtracking on her own tracks, and then all of a sudden she finds a, an animal has been tracking her. And at some point, their, their tracks come together. And at that point, she goes into the visionary mode. She enters the story of, of, of the wolf and becomes the wolf. She learns to speak its language. She understands, I should say, she understands its language. And that's the way all the Vision Quest stories go. You can understand the, the language of the animal. You can communicate with it. You kind of forget about being human. Everything human seems foreign and alien to you. The smell of smoke is a little scary. You don't want to come close to humans' camp. The smell of their their food and everything is kind of weird. So she stays she stays with uh, with the animal for she learns she learns its song, and and then the elders dream, and they dream to the wolf and they say send her back, and uh, so the wolf says it's time for you to go back now, and she picks up the axe goes back, she's really scared, she doesn't want to enter into the camp because she's just scared of human tracks and the smell of smoke. But the elders come out, they grab her, they put their coat around her, and they sing their songs, their power songs, their medicine songs over her, and that brings her back. And from that point on, um, you are not allowed to say anything about the, what happened. If you do, you blow it, it goes right away, it goes away. Furthermore, it may even be worse than go away, the animal may be really mad at you and something bad will happen. So you never talk about your, your vision quest experience and never sing your power song unless some really dramatic circumstance calls, calls upon it. So if, for instance, in later life, uh, somebody close to you is sick or somebody close to you is being attacked by somebody else's power, which which is often an explanation for why somebody has become sick if it's not just some normal old age or even if it's a broken leg or something, they will often attribute that to, to somebody's malevolent use of their power. In that case, you can deploy your song and uh, you can either do it through your dream, and often the, the, you'll, you'll do it, you'll, you'll dream ahead to find out who, who the person is who's doing this. And then in your dream, you'll have this fight between the two songs, the two competing songs, and you'll vanquish that person. Um, if you think about the teachings of the dreamers, you won't kill them. If you, in the old days, they say, in the old days, you just go all the way. You'd like, no problem, you'd kill the person. Uh, but now you think about heaven and you don't do that. Um, and I guess this leads me to another another chapter in, in Trail to Heaven. Uh, Tommy, before he became a, a recognized song keeper, was a really fierce drunk. He was a, a very powerful man, uh, and uh, from his medicine powers, just just is a very very. He, do, he looks gentle. He's a big, overweight guy with diabetes now. But you know he's got a lot of power, and uh, but he was a fierce drunk, and but he always sang songs when he when he was drinking, too. So he did keep up the tradition, and one time Howard Broomfield and I were staying with with Tommy in his house, which we called the Mansion on the Hill because it was after country western song. Everybody names things after country and western songs or country and western singers and stuff. Uh, so we were in the mansion in the hill, and everybody was drinking a little bit, not super much, but, you know, drinking, which is not a good thing in Dunizov. It really is not. It's a, it's a horrible scourge, and has taken a lot of lives. Um, but anyway, it was happening. And uh, a couple of younger guys were in there uh, singing with Tommy uh, and having a good time, a really good time. And uh, a young man came in, uh, who had recently been super ultra converted to to fundamentalist uh, evangelical Christianity and had taken up preaching and, and stuff on his on his own, <clears throat> and he was also drinking, which he shouldn't have been doing, and he confronted Tommy. Uh, he 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 said, uh, "You think you're tough? You don't have any power. You can't you can't do anything," and and there was this stunned silence. It was just like. 
oh my God, what is Tommy going to do? Is he going to kill him? He could, you know, because uh, the, there was another time when Tommy, I had this conversation with, and there's a whole passage in the book about this. I'll give a little aside to this, a, a passage when we were in the King Coin laundromat in Fort St. John, and Tommy uh, told me the told me the story of his vision quest and how he how he almost committed suicide and then was saved by his powers. Uh, but at, at one point, he just he locked his eyes on me, which was. He was so powerful when he did stuff like that. And he looked at me and he, he said, I could kill you guys, you and Howard. And then he laughed and said, but I won't do it, I love you. And oh, it was, it was just this powerful moment. So, so now, what is Tommy going to do? And this was like, it was cold, it was, it was April, but it was really cold. It was like, you know, below zero and everything. It was cold up there. And Tommy disappeared, he left his own house. And uh, the next day we decided, well, we'd drive into town and see what was going on. Tommy had gotten a ride into Fort St. John, continued drinking there. Um, and uh, so we had, we had, there was a whole other series of really interesting events that I've talked about in the book that I don't need to go into. But uh, the, the moral of that story is uh, this was a demonstration of his power rather than using it against somebody and instead he listened to the dreamer rather than using it against a close relative and a dear friend you know still this young man is he's not so young now but he's still around he's still quite christian and indeed tommy not too long after uh became christian as well he had a conversion experience he stopped drinking he became a song keeper he became um he doesn't attend church but he came up you know he incorporated the two. He said, Charlie Yahya's teachings and, and the teachings in, in the Bible are all the same. Uh, so it was, a, it was a, good, a good way out of, of a, a horrible situation that he was in because the drinking, you know, he killed so many people. And um, he didn't drive. He still doesn't drive. So that's probably a saving grace for him because uh, people got killed drinking and driving. Uh, but uh, it was a demonstration of, of, of one, his, his power, the medicine power, the, the songs, and the other, uh, his commitment to the teachings of the dreamer, who are, if you, if you kill somebody, you take that person's debts on, and you don't want to do that, you won't get to heaven. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a, a, a really, really powerful experience. Um, uh, one of the very first encounters, the only time, in fact, that I've ever heard uh, a medicine song sung was the very first summer, 1964. We were camped, uh, a bunch of uh, the people from Prophet River were, were camped at mile 176 on the Alaska Highway. I was there in my truck and everything. Uh, and uh, an old man, Chapeza, uh, Charlie Yai, uh, uh, Johnny Chapeze's dad, had uh, had a series of heart attacks and had been in the hospital on and off all, all that summer. And he finally talked him into letting him go. He said, I've just, I've, I know I'm gonna die. I've gotta be with my people, let me go. And they did, they let him go. He came, camped out, uh, and for a week, he sang these songs and told stories to people. And, and uh, I asked, uh, well, for a week that happened. Uh, and then he died. Uh, I was right there when he died. Um, and, and I asked Johnny what, what was going on. And he said, he's been saying goodbye to all his animals. He's singing his songs, his, his power songs, and saying goodbye to all of his friends. And one of his, one of his um, two of his friends, one was Chickadee, and, and the, other, the other was Fox. And um, believe it or not, uh, after the, the day after he died, people saw fox tracks all around the camp. And I, I myself saw a moose crossing the seismic line just within sight of camp, which is never seen that before in a place where hunters are camped. Moose don't usually come that close. So uh, that, that was another majorly transformative experience, and I, I talk about that in the book. 
And uh, fortunately, we found pictures of uh, Japesa from when he was probably in his 30s or so. Um, there was a physical anthropologist, I haven't mentioned this, but a physical anthropologist whose only interest was in measuring people's skulls, um, who came through uh, Fort St. John area in 1930, approximately 1930, and he photographed them. He measured all these skulls, which are completely useless information, and, uh, but he also photographed them. Didn't name anybody, of course, um, but a number of them were people that I knew. Um, in their earlier days, and one was Chapeza, who, who was there, who I saw die. Um, a number of others, the, the John Davis that Jillian talked about uh, giving testimony in the court case, was there uh, as a young man. Charlie Dominic, uh, uh, Maeve Sasson's father, a, n a number of them were there. And, and uh, I was able to with the help of elders in the 1960s, I was able to identify everybody in, in those pictures. Of course, the, the uh, physical anthropologist had no interest in who the people were. He just wanted the measurements of skulls, and God only knows what, what kind of theories, frenetic theories he had at the time, but they, they've long passed into the dustbin of history.